All right. Well, we might get started if everyone wants to grab a seat. That'd be amazing. Thanks, everyone. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who are new or visiting this morning, my name's uh, Cameron. I'm one of the pastors here at Canterbury Gardens. And uh, I really hope you've been enjoying our series in uh, 1 and 2 Kings. We're actually almost at the halfway point now of 2 Kings, so there's not long to go. We've been doing well. But we're really going to pick up the pace today, uh, and we're actually going to be covering three chapters this morning, uh, three long chapters. And it also is not the most light-hearted passage you'll ever read in Scripture. It's pretty, pretty brutal. There's death, conspiracy, judgment, political warfare, or in other words, it's a lot like our world today. And as we've seen throughout Kings, Kings doesn't shy away from real history, the good, the bad. It confronts it all as God works in the midst of sinners in a sinful world. Now, obviously, with a passage like today, we won't be able to go through verse by verse and look through all the details of what's going on here. So today will be more of a zoomed out picture of chapters 8 to 10. But there's one main point that I want you to see that I think runs right throughout these chapters, and that's this, that God brings justice according to his word. God brings justice according to his word. And we're going to see him bring justice in three very different types of people. We're going to see God bring justice to the faithful. We're going to see him bring justice to the rebellious. And we're going to see him bring justice to the zealous. And so let's make our way through these three different types of people we see in this passage. But as before we do that, I invite you to pray uh, with me for yourselves and, and for me as we begin this text. Lord, we ask now that... By your spirit in us, you'll reveal what this text has to say to us today. I pray that you'll work in our hearts, point us to your son, and help it to make a difference in our lives this week. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we're going to start by reading from verse 1 of chapter 8. So read with me the first two verses. It says this. Now, Elisha had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God had said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines seven years. Now, I'm assuming you haven't forgotten about this Shunammite woman. She appeared only a few chapters ago, but if for some reason you miss that. Just a reminder of who she is. She was a wealthy woman who basically offered up a dwelling for Elisha to stay at. And Elisha, in return, almost for her generosity, he asked her what he could do for her, and he provided a son for this woman. And then this son died, and Elisha miraculously raised him to life. But now, somewhat surprisingly, she's back on the scene. And we learn that Elisha had said to her, to leave the land of Israel due to a famine on the nation, which actually should remind us back in 1 Kings chapter 17 when Elijah himself had predicted a drought for three years, here's a famine for seven years, the judgment is increasing as we go throughout the book of Kings. But what we see here is this woman continues to show faith, doesn't she? We saw in the original passage that her faith grew as she saw the miraculous things being done through Elisha, and now she shows faith again. She immediately obeys what the man of God has said. She went away and spent seven years in the land of the Philistines. And we shouldn't underestimate this act of faith, should we? She's uprooting her family out of her own land, and she's going to live in a foreign land for seven years. That's a big step, uprooting your whole family to go. But we know that this woman is a woman of faith, and that faith has continued to grow. Her faith in the word of the Lord through the prophet. Look at verse 3. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and land. 
the king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and had said, tell me about all the great things that Elisha has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, this is the woman, my lord, the king, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. Now this text leaves out a lot of details that we might like to have, but we see that after seven years, this Shunammite woman comes back to the land and sees that her land has been dispossessed. Now we don't know why it's been dispossessed. We don't know by who, but we know the main point is that an injustice has been done to this woman and her family and so what does she do she goes and appeals to the king and then we see this interesting exchange between Gehazi and the king and again there's lots of questions here why is Gehazi talking to the king why is the king so interested in what Elijah's been doing we don't see all the details here but again we know the main point, that just as Gehazi is speaking about the Shunammite woman and how Elijah restored her son from the dead, she walks through the door. It's kind of a funny scene, isn't it? You can imagine Gehazi's surprise, like, here's the woman, right here, actually. She's just walked through the door. And so she tells the king her situation, and she receives back her land and all the revenue, all the money that she had lost while she was gone. What a coincidence, right? Well, no, not at all. You see, what we have here is a picture of God continuing to look after this faithful woman. And this time there's no Elisha or Elijah present, but it's God himself looking after this faithful woman. We see a beautiful picture of how God's providence, he aligns the whole situation to bring favour to this woman. I don't know if you've ever had that in your life where you feel like God's just lined up all the details. But the wider question is, why is this story placed here? Because it seems rather insignificant, doesn't it? Considering what came before and what comes after. I mean, we just saw the whole Syrian army come against Israel and God miraculously provide grace to them when they didn't deserve it. And immediately after this, we're going to see this whole political upheaval, the downfall of kings and idolaters. And right in the middle of these two stories is this little story about a faithful Shunammite woman and how God provides for her. And so why is it here? Well, I think that's the point of that story. It's here to show that in the midst of global political warfare, our people of kings and kingdoms, God is interested in bringing justice to this one faithful Shudamite woman who lost her land. We get a picture of a God who's working, yes, in the big events of the nation of Israel, but he's also working in the small details of those who are faithful to him. And he brings justice to her speedily. He does not forget about this woman. And I wonder if today you need to be reminded about this faithful Shunammite woman. You see, the world is a big and scary place. We're about to see that in the rest of this section. And it's easy to believe in the midst of current world events and all the things that are going on and and all the other people's lives that seem so much more important that God does not care about my small little life and the injustices that are being done in my world. But that is not true. He cares about the problems. He cares to bring justice to those who are people of faith, just like this Shunammite woman. In fact, there's a New Testament parable told by Jesus, which is strikingly similar. You wonder if this is kind of the inspiration for Jesus' parable. Because in Luke 18, verses 2 to 8, we read this. He said, In a certain city there there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. Sounds a lot like 
those Israelite kings, right? And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused. But afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. You see, God is a God who brings justice to his faithful people. He will not delay long over them. And maybe this morning you've forgotten what our God is like. In your own circumstances, in the, in the troubles of your own life, Maybe you've forgotten that God sees and he cares about the individual stories and your individual small acts of faith that you take each day. Our lives often feel insignificant and small, and yet God takes notice and he is ready to bring justice to us. And so let us continue to be people of faith like this Shunammite woman. To trust the one who pays attention and sees all the details of our lives and can align in his providence to bring us justice. And so that's what we see here in this first story. A God who brings justice to one faithful woman in the midst of all that's going on and all that's about to happen. Well, we're going to move on to the next section now and it's going to take a very different turn. Uh, And it's going to get a little bit more tricky, so we're going to have to skim the surface of some of these verses. But I want to encourage you to to stay in the text in your word in front of you, to follow along with this story. Uh, We're going to zoom through it faster, but it's important for us to see the details. So, let me just give a verbal recap of what happens in the rest of chapter 8, because ultimately the rest of chapter 8 is really about setting us up for Jehu coming in chapter 9 and 10. But there's something important we need to remember before we get into it. Firstly, we need to remember back to 1 Kings 19. Now, it's a while ago, I don't expect you to remember. But what happened there was it was just after Elijah had fleed from Jezebel and God had comforted comforted him through the still small voice on the mountain. You remember that scene, right? And just after that, Elijah was told to anoint some people. He was told to anoint Haziel king of Syria, instead of Ben-Hadad, and he was told to anoint Jehu, king of Israel, instead of Ahab. And the inexplicable purpose of that was to bring judgment on Israel. Now, we don't know why, but it appears that Elijah never actually fulfilled that command. We don't know why. Uh, Maybe he got distracted by other things. Who knows? But In these chapters, we're going to see the fulfillment. Elisha brings fulfillment to this command back in 1 Kings 19. So, to briefly run through what takes place, follow along with me. We see in verse 7 that Ben-Hadad becomes sick. And so what does he do? He sends Hazael to go and talk to Elisha to see if he's going to recover. Now, this is already interesting because just a few chapters ago, who else was sick and where did they consult? Ahaziah, he became sick, king of Israel, and he went to consult the false gods of Baal. And here we have someone from Syria, someone from Syria consulting Elisha. It's clearly to show here that Israel's become so bad that even their enemies are acknowledging Yahweh before, uh, more than they are themselves. Anyway, Hazael goes to Elisha and asks him, will Ben-Hadad recover from this illness? And Elisha replies and says, yes, but he's going to die anyway. Read with me in verse 11 what it says here. And Elisha fixed his gaze and stared at him until he was embarrassed. And the man of God wept. And as Hazael said, why does my Lord weep? He answered, because I know the evil that you will do to the people of Israel. You will set on fire their fortresses and you will kill their young men with the sword and dash in pieces their little ones and rip open their pregnant women. And Hazael said, what is your servant who is but a dog that he should do this great thing? Elisha answered, the Lord has shown me that you are to be king over Syria. And so this interesting exchange takes place here and and it shows us a couple of things. First of all, it shows us the compassion 
of these prophets. Like, sometimes I think we think of these prophets as somewhat removed and just pronouncing judgment and and that's all they do. But here we have Elisha mourning over the the pronouncement of judgment that ultimately is coming upon Israel. He's grieved. But also, we need to remember that this is part of that prophecy, right? Chapter 19, we didn't read it, spoke about that those who escape Jehu's sword will be wiped out by Hazael. This is God's sovereign judgment coming to Israel. And you wonder whether Elisha saying this to Hazael was the very thing that motivated him to go home and to kill his king. And that's exactly what he does. The next day, Hazael goes back, he takes a bedcloth, dips it in water, and puts it over Ben-Hadad's face until he dies. And so Hazael reigns in Syria, and the judgment is set. Now, the next bit's a little bit confusing because we get a lot of kings with frustratingly similar names. I think it's like the John of this day and age. It's Joram. So what we see is it's setting up this political field for us. In verse 16, we see that Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, remember Jehoshaphat, the, real, the good but pretty naive king who always seemed to be helping people he shouldn't? Well, his son, Joram, begins to reign over Judah, and we learn that he walked in the same pattern of the kings of Israel. Now, why did he walk in the same pattern as the kings of Israel? It's important detail. Verse 18 tells us why. Because he had taken one of the daughters of Ahab for his wife. So here we have Judah aligning itself with Israel, becoming as sinful as them for one reason, because they've aligned themselves with Ahab's family who are pronounced to be judged by Yahweh. And yet, another important detail to notice is despite the union here of Judah and Israel in evil, there is one distinct difference between them. And that's verse 19. Look at that. Yet the Lord was not willing to destroy Judah for the sake of David his servant, since he promised to give a lamp to him and to his sons forever. And so despite... Israel and Judah being united in their sin, being as bad as one another, the difference is that God has made a promise to preserve a line, a lamp in the house of David. And so what we see already in this text is a God who is being faithful to work out his plans of judgment and faithful to work out his plans of salvation. So, next, Jehoram of Judah dies, and his son, Ahaziah, reigns in his place. And as we close out chapter 8, we learn that Ahaziah only reigns one year, which we'll find out why soon. We also learn that his mother is Atalia. Now, she will become important later, so keep that name in mind. But again, it mentions that Ahaziah was evil because he was the son-in-law to the house of Ahab. So I don't know if you can see what's going on in the rest of chapter 8. At every turn, we read the name Ahab. Ahab, Ahab, Ahab. It's just mentioned all over the place, right? It's like this text is trying to show us that this family are like a plague that's infecting everything they come into contact with. Ahab's family has already caused the irreversible judgment pronounced upon Israel, and now they've drawn, drawn Judah into that. They've dragged them down through this connection with the family of Ahab. They're like a plague. They're corrupt and they're evil and they must be judged. It's setting us up to see that God's judgment is a just judgment. It's not coming lightly. The sin is great and it needed to go. And so the final note, verse 28, is an important one. It says that Ahaziah went with Joram, the son of Ahab, again Ahab, to make war against Hazael, king of Syria, at Ramoth-Gilead, and the Syrians wounded Joram. Now, those of you with a keen memory, what does that remind you of? Who else went up to make war against against Syria at Ramoth-Gilead? Well, if you remember, it was Ahab with Jehoshaphat. And so what we see here is the same thing happening to Ahab's son, Joram. He goes up, he's wounded in the same way as his father. You see, judgment is coming and it's all too familiar for the house of Ahab. And so Joram, king of Israel, 
He's wounded, he goes back to Jezreel, and his best buddy Ahaziah, king of Judah, comes and visits him there. What a good friend, right? So the stage is set now for what? For God's justice and his sword of judgment to come upon Ahab's family, just as was promised. And so enter Jehu. Now we're going to pick up the pace even more here, but just for a moment, I want us to at least see this guy Jehu, to begin to build a bit of a profile about the kind of guy this guy is. So read with me from verse 1 of chapter 9. Then Elisha, the prophet, called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee. Do not linger. Or as the NLT says, open the door and run for your life. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have a word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house, and the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel." And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, and the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door, and he ran for his life, right? (laughs) See, do you see the picture building of this guy Jehu? He's a commander of an army. Clearly, he's an intimidating guy. The prophet says, anoint him and get out of there. Like he's going to lash out at any moment and just destroy this guy. So it's interesting to see this profile build, but notice that the writer wants us to know very clearly why he's being anointed. He's being anointed as God's instrument to bring judgment upon Ahab's family and upon Jezebel, just as he had promised would take place. God will avenge the blood of his people that was spilled by Jezebel and by Ahab. So, for the rest of 9 and 10, which we won't read through due to time, we're going to see Jehu involved in four separate slaughters. It really is the most brutal text in all of Kings. This guy goes on a rampage. So, I'm going to briefly recap those stories, okay? So, you can follow along in your text. You can read them. They're full-on stories. But, firstly, we see Jehu heads towards Jezreel. Now, who's in Jezreel? It wasn't long ago. Uh, In Jezreel, we have Joram who's injured, and Ahaziah, his best buddy, visiting him. And we get this movie-like scene where we have Jehu in his chariot with his commanders charging towards the city, and the watchmen of the city look out and they see this group of people approaching them, and they, they can't quite tell who it is, so they send a messenger out, and the messenger comes to Jehu and says, is it for peace? And in verse 18, he says, what do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And so the messenger joins the charge towards the city. And then the watchman looks again, and this time he can identify that it is Jehu. And how can he identify him? I like this. Verse 20, he says he's driving furiously. Or or NLT puts it like a madman. I feel like I could tell some of you by your driving furiously, but I won't name names. But it clearly is building this imagery of of Jehu, right? He's this crazy guy. He's got a reputation for driving furiously and for killing people. But he continues going towards the city and they send out another messenger. Same thing happens. He joins them and they keep marching towards the city. And I think we're getting this imagery here of God's judgment is coming and there is nothing that can be done to stop it. It's coming upon the house of Ahab. It's drawing nearer and nearer. And eventually, 
Jehu arrives and Joram, perhaps quivering by this point, says, is it peace? And verse 22, he replies, what peace can there be so long as the whorings and sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Pretty blunt answer, not beating around the bush. And so Jehu proceeds to kill Joram and pronounces in verse 26 to take his body and put it in the plot of land belonging to Naboth. Remember him? The one who Ahab unjustly killed? And so Jehu here is zealous to fulfill God's word. So he kills Ahaziah as well, and the first slaughter is done. Okay, next on Jehu's hit list, Jezebel. So look at verse 30. She seems to predict that She's next on the list because, oddly enough, she paints her eyes and adorns her head as if she's almost preparing herself for her fate. And Jehu arrives, and I'm not going to go into the details of why, but three eunuchs, Jehu calls out to them, and they throw her out of the building. She lands on the ground, blood splatters everywhere, and Jehu tramples over her with her horse. And then building this profile of Jehu, what does he do next? He goes and has something to eat and drink. Because what do you do after killing someone? It's tiring work. You go and have something to eat and drink in her house. And then he comes back to bury her and the dogs have eaten everything except the skull, palms of her feet and her hands. The palms of her hands and her feet, other way around. And so the second slaughter's done. But pretty full on, right? Well, it gets worse. Next scene, third slaughter. Jehu comes up with this cunning plan in chapter 10 where he commands all the guardians of Ahab's sons to go up and fight against Hazael, king of Syria. Now, you can imagine their response to this, right? Who just went up to Hazael and and completely got um, destroyed? That was Joram and Ahaziah. So they're freaking out that they don't want to do this. And they say to Jehu, look, we're going to do whatever you want. Just don't make us do that. And so he says, well, what I want you to do is to cut off all the heads of Ahab's sons. And then he commands them to put them in two piles at the entrance to the gate of the city. And in verse 10 of chapter 10, he proclaims this to all the people. Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord that he spoke concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done what he said by the prophet Elijah. Again, reaffirming this promise is being fulfilled. But notice also the very next verse. Verse 11, it says that he struck down all who remained of Ahab's house in Jezreel, his great men, his friends, his priests, until he left him none remaining. Now, what I find interesting here is that's pretty comprehensive, right? It's pretty comprehensive. His friends, are they really of the house of uh, of, um, Ahab? Don't know. We'll come back to that point a bit later, but he clearly likes to kill people. And so he goes to Samaria and he finds relatives of Ahaziah, king of Judah, along the way. And so, what does he do? What Jehu does best. He kills them, because why not? And then he kills 42 of his relatives. And then he finds this random guy named Jehonadab and he comes... And what does he say in verse 16? It's an interesting statement here. He says, come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. And so he goes to Samaria and he strikes them down and sort of three is complete. And finally, and perhaps most brutal of all these affairs, is Jehu's final accomplishment in verses 18 to 27 of chapter 10 where once again he displays this attitude of achieve the outcome by any means possible, as he proclaims throughout the land, in verse 18, that Ahab, well, yeah, he served Baal a little bit, but I'm I'm going to serve him greatly, and I'm going to offer him a great sacrifice. And so what he does is he puts this pronouncement out to the, the whole kingdom and says, bring all the prophets of Baal. I'm going to have a great sacrifice for Baal, and he puts these special robes on them. They all go into the house of Baal, and uh, Jehu goes in there with them. He closes the door behind him. He, he offers this sacrifice, the fake sacrifice, because they don't realize that they're actually the sacrifice. He walks out of the front door, 
closes the door behind him and says to his commanders that are stationed outside, go in there and slaughter every single one of them, lest, if you don't, you'll lose your life in exchange. And so he does that. He kills all the prophets of Baal. They tear down the house of Baal. And in verse 28, we see the summary that Jehu had wiped out Baal from Israel. And so that ends what only can be described as perhaps the most brutal couple of chapters in the whole Bible, right? And so what do we do with all of that? What do we do with that? Well, it's important for us to notice the threads that consist throughout these slaughters. And that's that fact that Jehu is fulfilling God's promise to the house of Ahab. That this is God's judgment being dealt out by the sword of Jehu. Six times through these slaughters, we see a reference to God's pronouncement of judgment coming to fruition through, Ahab, uh, through the promise that he made about Ahab's household through Jehu. And so what we see here is just like in our first story of the Shunammite, that God brought justice to his faithful follower according to his word. Now God brings justice to the rebellious line of Ahab according to his word word. You see, what we have here is a very in-your-face picture of God's judgment against sin. That God had proclaimed judgment would come upon this family and it came upon this family. And so imagine how the original audience would have taken this text. Sitting in exile, they've been warned time and time again, judgment's coming, Babylon's coming, and yet they did not turn away and they were destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. They were exiled out of the land, and now they're sitting here reading this text, and they're thinking, we should have listened. We should have listened that God's judgment, as he pronounced, it came just like he said. And it's the same God that we serve today. This is an Old Testament God. This is the God of the Bible. And do you know what the New Testament promises time and time again? That there is a day coming where God is going to pour out his judgment on all who are rebellious to him. All who reject Christ. And that judgment is just as certain to be fulfilled as what we see here in 2 Kings. And so we can't help but wince at the brutality of the sword of Jehu, but the reality is that the wider Bible reveals to us that the sword of Christ will be much more comprehensive. that just as none of the house of Ahab escaped from Jehu's judgment in 2 Kings 9 and 10, so none outside of Christ will escape from the sword of Christ as we see in Revelation. You know, this passage is a stark warning to all of us who are walking in rebellion to God. To those of us who are willing walking in sin to turn back to know that God's judgment is coming, to know that as Ephesians 5, 5 to 6 says, that you can be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. You see, God brings justice to his faithful follower, like the Shunammite woman, but he also brings justice to the rebellious and we can be sure of it. Well, let's finish off this passage, because there's one more thing we need to see here. Looking at verse 28 of chapter 10. Thus, Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk according to the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. So we get this summary that all the kings get of their life and we've seen, right, throughout this passage that Jehu is zealous for God's word, right? He's zealous to see idolatry crushed. 
And yet, what do we read in verse 29? Jehu did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam with the golden calves. So we see that Jehu was zealous at destroying certain idols, but not others. However, in verse 30, we read something else interesting about what God says to Jehu. He says, you've done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, the son, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on your throne of Israel. Now, I read this and it's quite confronting. Here's God's approval of all that's just happened in the previous two chapters. Or is it? I think this is where we need to be a little bit careful because it's true that some of what Jehu did was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did wipe out the line of Ahab according to God's promise and yet I don't think this statement is meant to be taken as a wholesale approval of everything that Jehu did and the means and extent to which he did these things. Now, why do I say that? Well, for two reasons, one of them primary reason. Firstly, we know from other texts that some of Jehu's actions are frowned upon by God. In Hosea 1.4 we read this and this is key. Hosea 1.4, when he's, Hosea is naming one of his sons, it says this, Call him Jezreel, for in just a little while I will punish the house of Jehu for the blood of Jezreel. You see that? God is pronouncing punishment on Jehu for the blood, and on his household, for the blood of Jezreel. Now Jezreel, that was all where that massacres took place, right? And so it's pretty clear. And so, so why is that the case? Well, there's clear evidence throughout this passage that I tried to allude to some of this, that his zealousness caused him to go beyond what the Lord had actually said, further than God's command. He was told to wipe out Ahab's house, right? But he kills his friends, his priests, he kills, he kills Ahaziah's relatives. They're not to do with Ahab's family. Either way, we know here from this Hosea passage that judgment was coming upon Jehu's household just like it was Ahab's household because of the blood of Jezreel. But also, there's something interesting to notice in verse 30. There's an allusion here, I think, which ties in with Hosea, that when God says to Jehu in verse 30 that his sons will sit on the, fourth, on the throne to the fourth generation, that this may actually have been intended to have judgment overtones. Because what was also strongly associated with the third and fourth generation was the revelation of who God was in Exodus, that he would not clear the guilty to the third and the fourth generation. There is perhaps here an overtone that judgment is also coming to Jehu and his household, just as it was to Ahab. He will be punished. But there's one final thing to notice. I think it's the text is deliberately drawing this out. In verse 30 and 31, there's an interesting contrast going on. God says to Jehu that you have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart. And then look at 31. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. And I think these verses are revealing something to us. It's showing us that just as God brought justice to the Shunammite, and he brings justice to the rebellious, he also brings justice to this zealot Jehu. Ultimately, Jehu himself will be punished and receive God's justice for his wicked acts because, yes, God used him to accomplish what was on his heart, but Jehu did not follow the Lord from his own heart. You see, Jehu also provides us with another warning. You see, Jehu was zealous for God, right? He was even zealous for the word of the Lord. He was zealous about condemning idolatry. And yet, he did not destroy the idolatry in his own heart, right? And you see, we too can be zealous for God. We can be passionate about his commands and about crushing the idols of our culture and compassionately condemn the world and yet at the same time not truly be serving God from our hearts, not truly dealing with the idolatry in our own hearts. You see, you can be so busy fighting for his word, condemning the cultural idols that you forget about your own heart. You see, it's not enough for us to be zealous for the Lord. We must have changed hearts. That's the news of the gospel. <laughs> 
We must beware of having a heart like Jehu with the appearance of godliness in zeal and passion, but not from the heart. And do you know who else was like that? The Pharisees. They had a passion for his word. They were zealous for God. And yet there was no change in their hearts. No transformation. No fruit of the spirit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. And so what we see here is God's gracious justice coming to a faithful woman and his just judgments coming upon two different types of rebels. We see God who brings the sword to bear on those who rebel against his word, either in outward rebellion, like the kings of Israel, or in inward rebellion, like Jehu, in a heart that was not changed. And that same God also promises today to bear his sword on all those who continue in their rebellion. Whether it's through running to the world in outright disobedience, or being zealous like the Pharisees, and this facade of religiosity that is actually a cover for our own sins. And yet, we also need to see here We need to remember that little line in chapter 8, because it's easy to forget about it in all this drama, right? That God promises to give David a lamp in Israel. We need to remember that God is faithful, yes, to carry out his justice and in judgment, but he's also faithful to his promise of salvation. And the striking thing is that this promise leads to Christ, right? And the striking thing for me is that in the midst of all this violence and chaos, we see the future lamp of Israel, Christ himself, go willingly to the cross. Why? That God may bear the sword of his wrath upon him. So that those of us who repent of our sins, who have faith, who walk by faith, like this Shunammite woman, may have our sins justly forgiven And that God may come on our side and justly, graciously intervene in our lives. You know, Romans says the God who gave us his his son, won't he also graciously give us all things? You see, the God, God is a God who brings justice according to his word. It will either be a justice that comes in the form of judgment like Ahab's family and and Jehu, or it will be a justice that comes in the wiping clear of our debt because of Christ. And the question to wrestle with is, where do you stand out of these options? Are you like the rebellious kings of Israel, walking in rebellion and you know it? Are you like Jehu, zealous, for God's word in certain aspects, zealous about condemning our culture that is going downhill, but not recognizing the sin in your own heart? Or are you like the faithful Shunammite, who puts your faith in God, who recognizes, yes, the sin that's still present, recognizes the tendencies towards being like Jehu and the tendencies towards being like the kings of Israel, but repenting and keeping our faith in Christ. And so the call of this passage is, to not be like the rebellious kings, to not be like Jehu, but to be like the faithful Shunammite, to have faith in Christ, and ultimately, as Romans 3 says, that through him we become obedient to God in our hearts. And that this can happen because Christ bore the sword of God's wrath on our behalf. Let's pray. Lord, these passages are always so uh, full on sometimes. When we read through them, it's hard to know where we go. And yet, Lord, we see here that it reveals who you are as as our God, that you are the God who is a God of justice. And you'll bring justice to all people. You'll bring, bring justice to those who place their faith in you because you've paid for their sins justly upon the cross And then, because of that, you are on our side. You come to the aid of us in all the trials and circumstances of life. You justly rescue and help. But you're also a God who brings justice to those who don't have faith. 
whether they're outwardly rebellious or inwardly rebellious, your judgment is coming. And we are called to examine, to scrutinize our lives, to, to place our faith in you, to repent and look to Christ. And so, Lord, help us this morning to see our own hearts, but help us most of all to place our faith in Jesus as the one who bore the wrath of God for our benefit. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.